hello guys how are you welcome back to your own youtube channel arls updates and uh, recent exams for more updates related to our recent arls exam writing task topics listening reading practice tasks on daily basis subscribe for more videos for every day listening practice task join today to achieve your dream score Please hit the like and subscribe button, press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page as updates and recent exams. Now look at part 1. You will hear a woman asking a shop assistant about DVD players. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hello, I'm interested in buying a DVD player. Can you help me, as I don't know very much about them? Of course. We sell quite a range. Actually, we're doing a customer survey at the moment, so I wonder if I could fill in this form about you, and that will actually help me to advise you on the best DVD player for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> First of all, your occupation. Um, student. OK. Then, have you already got a DVD player? Uh, no, I've never had one before. Uh-huh. And how much do you think you want to spend on a player? Mm, I'm not sure, really. But I have got a budget. My friend said I should allow about £100. But I can't afford over £85, so that's what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And... Do you watch DVDs very often? Um, depends what you mean by often. I don't know what the norm is. Is it about two a week? Uh, I suppose I watch three a month. That's enough for me. Yes. <laughs> what sort of films do you like watching then? Action movies? <laughs> Not really. Oh. My boyfriend always insists we watch science fiction movies, but... I prefer thrillers. Something to get your teeth into. OK. Just one more. Do you watch other DVDs? Ones that are not films, like music or something? Not much, because I don't want to spend the money on something I can watch on TV. But I occasionally rent out comedy programmes. And I fight with my boyfriend over all the sports DVDs he watches. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK, let me explain a bit to you about the DVD players that are in your price range. First, there's the DB30, which has only got basic features, but it is a bargain at £69. Now, all the DVDs come with an after-sales service that starts when the guarantee runs out. As it's so cheap, the DB30 comes with a limited after-sales service, as it only includes parts. You would have to pay for most of the repair. Mm, seems OK. Mm. Then a slight grade up from that is the XL643. This comes with an additional feature in that it has an extra button allowing you to record. That's quite useful. Oh, yes. That would mean spending less on DVDs to watch. Yes. 
so you'd make the extra money back on it that it costs. Mm. Let me see how much it is. Uh, ah, yes, that one's actually reduced at the moment from seventy-nine pounds to seventy-one ninety-nine. Oh. I think it's worth the extra myself. And is that the same level of after-sales service as the other one? Well, you get a bit more for your money because what we're offering is a discount on labour. So you don't pay the full price if you have to call an engineer out. I see. Then the last one is this Tri-X 24. It's a very good player and you can use it to listen to your CDs as well as watch DVDs. Mm, it looks nice, but I bet it's expensive. No, it's not top of the range. Let's see. Yes, it's £94. But what you have to remember is that that includes insurance, so you don't have to pay extra for that. And it comes with a guarantee that's valid for three years, as opposed to the usual one. What do you think? Hmm, maybe... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a talk about au pairs in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. What is an au pair? An au pair is a single girl without any dependents who comes to the UK to learn English and to live as part of an English-speaking family. She is not a domestic servant, but may help in the house for up to five hours a day for pocket money. Suitable tasks would be light housework, and taking care of children. She should have one day each week completely free and she should be free to attend language classes and religious services if she wishes. Pocket money should be between 15 and 20 pounds per week and she should have her own room. Before she arrives she should have as much information as possible about the home she is going to and what she will be expected to do. She will find it helpful to have a letter from her hostess explaining the arrangements to show the immigration officer when she arrives. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. An au pair must be a single girl aged at least 17 and no older than 27 when she first becomes an au pair. She must be a national of a Western European country which includes Malta, Cyprus and Turkey. The longest a girl may stay in the UK as an au pair is two years. A girl who has been in the UK before as an au pair will be allowed to come to the UK again 
as an au pair only if the total period is not more than two years. An au pair is not allowed to take a job in this country. The light household duties which are part of the au pair arrangement are not regarded as employment. An au pair who is a national of a country which is not in the Commonwealth or European Community, EC, and who is admitted for longer than six months will normally have to register with the police. This will be shown in her passport. She must take her passport and two passport sized photographs to a police station. She will have to pay a fee, about £25. If an au pair wishes to stay longer than the time stamped in her passport, she may apply either by post to Luna House, Croydon, or in person at one of the public inquiry offices. If she applies by post, it is a good idea to send any valuable documents by recorded delivery post. She should apply before the time limit on her permitted stay runs out. She must show that the arrangements are still those of an au pair. She may change host families during her time in the UK, providing that the new arrangements are also those of an au pair. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear Dr. Joanna Robinson, the course director of a language learning center, answering questions from reporters from the student newspaper. First, look at questions 21 to 26. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 21 to 26. Write no more than three words or numbers for each answer. Welcome to the Language Learning Center. I'm Joanne Robinson. You must be the reporters from the Examiner. Please come in and sit down. Hello, Dr. Robinson. Yes, we're from the Examiner. I'm Cheryl Perkins, and this is Don Klim. May I start with a question? Did this college really start with Brazilian students? It did. The Language Learning Center was founded in 1985 to look after a group of students from Brazil who wanted to study here. Those 20 students soon grew to 60, and as you can imagine, we had severe accommodation problems. Somebody said you were in the old amenities block, right near the engineering school. They have a good memory. Yes, we were there because the university hadn't believed we would expand so quickly. The problem wasn't solved until we moved into these new premises in Bancroft House in 1987. When did you start taking students from other countries? About 1990. We now have students from 13 different countries enrolled, and we expect a large group from Turkey next month. Yes, we've noticed a lot more advertisements for Turkish restaurants in our advertising section. Well, 40% of our students come from Turkey, by far the largest single national group and I believe there's been an influx to the rest of the university. There are a lot of Turkish students studying hospitality. Do you offer anything special to the students? Yes, we do. There are several things which make us rather different from other language schools. English is certainly not restricted to English for academic purposes here. Sometimes we have extra classes for students who have particular courses in mind. And we have just said goodbye to a group of 30 Indonesian students who were preparing for a university course in agriculture. They came to us for English for farming, and they were with us for a long time. We miss them. 
How long do students usually stay at the language learning center? It varies, so I'll talk about the average. Most of our courses last for five weeks, but to make any real progress, a student needs to be here for at least three terms. That's fifteen weeks. The students do better if they have a little time to settle in at the beginning of the course, and we offer an orientation course that lasts a week. Most students take it. It helps them to settle down, and it gives us plenty of time to test them and place them at the right level. How many people are in each class? We sometimes go up to eighteen, but our average class size is fourteen students, and some classes have as few as seven participants. It depends on the needs of the group. You were saying that you miss your students when they go. How do you attract students? I mean, how do they hear about the language learning center in the first place? We're included in the university advertising and marketing, and we have our own website. The thing which works best for us, though, is word of mouth. Students who leave us often send us their friends. In fact, a student who arrived today was carrying a photograph for me of a former student and his baby. It sounds like a nice place to be. It is. A lot of our students make lasting friendships while they're here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Making friends with other students sounds special enough. I'd like to emphasize that in the student newspaper. We do try to get our students to be part of the wider university. How do you do that? Do you encourage them to join the sports center, for instance? Indeed, we do. The sports center is always looking for active participants, particularly in soccer. Oh, and something else. You might like to mention that we don't teach just English here. I mean, we're a language center, not an English language center. You may learn Spanish, Mandarin, and Russian here, and we can sometimes offer other languages. This means we can have some students who are native speakers of those languages as conversation partners for English-speaking students. Who can do these courses? At this stage, any native speaker of English. What about the people who are learning English? Can they do a non-English language course? At this time, only if they've almost finished their English language course. You see, we try very hard to involve students who are native speakers of English as conversation leaders, and we encourage our students to join groups on the campus. For instance, if they enjoy music, there is an active jazz group available to everyone, and that's a lot of fun. On the other hand, elementary students can't go to the drama group; their English just isn't ready for that sort of activity. But the university choir welcomes all the singers it can find. They often do large productions that need a lot of voices. I imagine the special conversation groups are open to all your students. I wish they were. I'm sorry to say they're a special service we provide for elementary students only. Is there anything else I can tell you? I'd be really pleased if you could write about the courses we offer in foreign languages. I think our readers will be very interested in that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the center. It's always good to let the rest of the students at the university know what goes on in our classrooms and outside them. After all, many of our students leave us and then study for degrees in various disciplines on this campus. That is the end of part three. To check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a talk on cat breeds. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Look at her, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't she beautiful? The Abyssinian is a natural breed of cat which originated in Africa, or more specifically, what is now Ethiopia. Today it is found in much of the surrounding African continent, particularly Somalia. Its head is broad and moderately wedge-shaped, and it has relatively large pointed ears like the specimen you can see here in front of you. It is typically a reddish colour and is known for the unusual M-shaped marking which often appears directly above the two eyes. See here. It has a medium length coat in a sort of ticked pattern, ticked being a term to describe when the hair gets progressively darker from root to tip. There you go little fellow, well done. Now this gentleman, he is a male, I can assure you, is the Aegean. The Aegean is of Greek origin, as you might have guessed, and is thought to have come from the Cycladic Islands. It's considered to be the only native Greek breed of cats. It is one of the newest and therefore rarest cat breeds, but relatively plentiful throughout Greece. It is much liked for its intelligence and friendliness, and because it excels in pest control. It has a semi-long-haired coat with rich tail. The coat is typically bi or tricolored, with white always present, and the other colors ranging from black to red, blue cream, etc. These colors are just as likely to present themselves as stripes. This little guy, as you can see, has beautiful reddish-blue stripes running through a pale coat. The head is medium-sized and quite round. The ears have a wide base, rounded tips, and are covered by hairs. Now the Australian. Australians are still mainly confined to distribution in their homeland. Obviously Australia, though a number of catteries in the UK have started to breed them too. Look at those expressive eyes. The cat is a fine example of the breed, medium-sized and short-haired. Notice also the large round head. This breed is much loved for its tolerance of children and because it is very rarely inclined to scratch. Its coat is typically spotted or, as in the case of this little fellow, classic tabby style. Last but not least, we have the bobtail, another relatively new breed like the Aegean and Australian. The bobtail first appeared in the 1960s in the United States the only country in which it has a significant distribution and is most notable for its stubby bobbed tail which is only something like one third to one half the length of a normal cat's tail. It is a very sturdy breed with rather shaggy and dense fur. Bob tails can have any colour fur and often have the appearance of a tabby. Unlike the other breeds we have discussed the bob tail is not natural it is said to be a result of the crossbreeding of a domestic tabby cat and a bobcat. Such is the careful breeding the cat has undergone that it comes in all colours. And there are also both long and short hair versions. If I had to recommend one of these breeds to you today, I would have to vouch for the Australian. After all, as all of us here are parents, we must surely agree that our children are our first consideration when it comes to purchasing a pet. 
what effect the animal will have on them, how will it react, etc. These are questions we all ask ourselves. And they are even more important when the child is very young. The Australian is simply unrivaled in the temperament department and is extremely unlikely to lose its composure and take a swipe at your child. That said, it is still a very rare breed in these parts. And as with all things in the world, rare equates to very expensive. So it may be beyond the price range some of you are prepared to pay. Surprisingly, perhaps, though the bobtail is part lynx or bobcat, as they say in the States, it doesn't appear to have inherited any of the wildcat's aggressiveness. And therefore, it makes an excellent second best as a pet you can allow to be around children. It is also considerably less expensive. The other two breeds we have talked about both make excellent house pets. However, hand on heart, I could not endorse either as a pet to have around young children. In my view, the child's safety is not something to gamble with. So, if you can afford the extra few quid to lay out for a bobtail, or better still, an Australian, do so. You won't regret it. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thanks for listening and God bless you all. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update our recent exam. For everyday listening practice test, for more material, visit my website www.altsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is also given below in the description. Please write your score below the comment section. And please like and subscribe my channel for more Alts listening practice tests on daily basis. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all.